There we go. Great. So, greetings, everybody. I'm Dave Ferguson, Dean of the College of Architecture and Planning. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this next installment of the CAT lecture series. Uh, before we hear from our speakers, I'd uh, just like to make a quick plug for our YouTube channel, where you can find most of our lectures stored for easy access. It's under Ball State University College of Architecture and Planning. We have multiple channels there, and if you just scroll down, you can easily find the CAP lectures videos. We have AIA credit today. Uh, just email CAP lectures at bsu.edu to request that if you haven't already. And now here's Sean Byrne, Assistant Professor of Architecture, to introduce today's guest speakers. Sean. Uh, hi. Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending today's presentation, both through Zoom and in here in person. Uh, today, we are privileged to be joined by Marian Weiss and Michael Manfredi, co-founders of the multidisciplinary firm Weiss Manfredi. Founded in 1989, Weiss Manfredi has received numerous awards and recognitions, including being named as one of North America's emerging voices by the Architectural League of New York, the New York AIA Gold Medal, and the Tau Sigma Delta Gold Medal. As practitioners, educators, and authors of several books, including site-specific, surface subsurface, and public natures, their work and teachings offer rich and insightful lessons to designers for how environments might be shaped harmoniously between the natural and the constructed. Their work on numerous projects, including Hunter's Point South Waterfront Park, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden Visitor Center, and the Olympic Sculpture Park Amendment, among many others, promotes the idea that the site is an active participant throughout the design process with architectural solutions that negotiate and coexist with the earth as well as the atmospheric conditions of the sky. On a personal level, I was fortunate to be a student in Marion Weiss's studio when I was in graduate school. I was also privileged to have Michael Manfredi on many of my reviews during that period. My approach to architecture and my research today has been shaped by these experiences, and I re remain grateful for the time I was able to study and learn from both of them. Please join me in welcoming Marion Weiss and Michael Manfredi. Well, uh, thank you so much, Sean, and thank you, Dave, uh, for uh, inviting us to speak here today and to join you all. And um, I think it's just worth saying uh, to all of you out there, Sean was an extraordinary student and we know is an extraordinary architect, or architect and instructor. And I find it really fitting that uh, you have been, I think, coordinating the first year program, which is a common program of architecture, urban design, and landscape. So bringing it all together which is what we're excited about is what we think you all are doing so well at the school. So I think we'll uh, we'll start. We actually will share um, 12 projects this evening that uh, are not arranged chronologically, but are arranged somewhat um, by uh, type and by um, content. So um, you'll bear with us as we get ourselves uh, started. I'll share a screen now. Uh, and so beginning with our the topic here of urban natures, I think the idea of constructing sites and constructing urbanity comes right down to the setting of the campus. We love the idea that uh, over time, um, the School of Architecture is kind of almost at the belly button of the campus, which uh, for us, I think, uh, is increasingly important as architecture engages a, a, an incredibly broad array of challenges and uh, its promise is its ability to uh, engage. So the question of engaging and, and being interconnected uh, so that the discipline of architecture in many ways can never be seen as an isolated fact is really brought into focus when we see something as uh, robust as the, the distant view of the earth. And then in many ways, as we see as fragile as it truly is from fire, flooding, earthquakes, we know that these urban uh, natures that we are addressing right now are in flux and are a challenge. And in fact, currently, if we think about the pandemic, hopefully becoming a little bit more of a distant vision, we do know that our built environment has been shaped by pandemics and it has transformed many of our cities and buildings. And we can't hide in the utopian ideals of a fortified city and even the temporal notions of these kind of perfected utopian urbanisms 
in many ways are incomplete in their inability to grow. And yet growth and change and the temporal kind of movement that we could see here in uh, the spiral jetty is what we think actually brings us into the question about can there be a more porous intersection between nature and public life? Our most recent book, Public Natures, really looks at this question of inhabitable infrastructures and uh, evolutionary infrastructures, which we believe can evolve to do more for the public realm. And similarly, uh, it's reciprocal, uh, but equally important, in the sense that there are ecological infrastructures, but also social infrastructures. And the two are intertwined. You can't address one without addressing the other. And um, we continue to be students. Uh, we've been developing and studying a series of precedents, case studies, in this case, Kaju Bridge, which marries the idea of infrastructural crossing with the building itself, or uh, Agrasan Kaboli, a, a beautiful Indian step well in Delhi where the ritual of gathering water is given shape. Um, and similarly, perhaps uh, slightly better known, uh, Gaudi's fantastic Parker Gwell, where the topography is given measure through architecture. So these different preoccupations, the idea that architecture is rich and hybrid, um, was uh, an opportunity for test for us to test out a number of ideas at the Venice Biennale where we were invited to share our work and we chose not to um, focus only on our work, but really um, recall some of these fantastic precedents that continue to inspire us. And out of these uh, ongoing series of studies well over the last decade, um, many of them you can see here in model form done by students, uh, done in our own office and tested in our own office. But then given shape in the definition of a small pavilion, in a way the making of a very small but discrete public space in the kind of chaos of the Biennale. It was uh, fabricated offsite uh, about 20 kilometers outside of Venice and then uh, crated into uh, a number of discrete uh, cartons and shipped uh, to the Arsenale. Um, fantastic kind of combination of ancient contexts and new technologies. This was done in a way um, uh, by a shop that builds boats. And you'll sense the sort of nautical, na um, nautical impressions and nods to the kind of great tradition of Venetian maritime architecture. So here the models are pulled apart. Um, the curators are starting to look at them for um, their installation. And the models, not only of our work, but of the kind of great precedents become part of a kind of common language of architecture, a kind of dialogue between past, present, and hopefully future. Um, the shell is constructed out of uh, um, uh, very, very sophisticated wood forming techniques. So new contemporary technologies, again, nod to the shipbuilding tradition in Venice. And yet many of our projects are really looking at that liminal space between uh, the site, uh, impossible infrastructures, and urban connections that might actually have longer uh, views, if you will, beyond even the boundaries of a site. The Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle, truly nine acres, subdivided by a highway and train lines, a deteriorating seawall contaminated by Union or California, and then the Northeast. This was what we uh, were given as a site to create an Olympic Sculpture Park here free and open to the public. The ultimate project, which many of you may recognize here, 200,000 cubic yards of earth uh, wandering across the highways to, and wandering from the city to reach the water's edge, was really a constellation of simultaneous problem solving, if you will, and possibilities of an infrastructure x-ray, which we're looking at here, and each one systemically breaking down the project into its systems of landscape, water collection, contamination, remediation, transportation, and hardscape, softscapes, and art. So that 200,000 cubic yards of earth uh, trucked from a nearby uh, excavation of the downtown museum expansion formed a new topography that could transcend the highway uh, and the train tracks and finally enable the city pedestrians, if you will, to reach the water's edge, even if uh, one of those 15 minute train lines was coming through. On opening day, you can start to see that that new topography is creating multiple precincts, multiple destinations within the finite nine acres, slowing down the experience with the zigzag path rather than speeding it up as the rest of the city does. But fabricating that landscape and landform really took this kind of 
amazing almost highway construction of mechanically stabilized earth soil and overlapping precast panels that could dynamically move if there was a seismic event, because of course this is in a seismic zone. And that unfolding of the land uh, form itself was also informing the nature of the pavilion itself, which is indeed topographically a constellation of poles to host uh, gatherings and events and actually open up to the valley here, which is featuring Richard Serra's Peace Wake. And that very piece is one that is, is the boundary edge, the north boundary uh, and the crossing one of the highway, which Michael's gonna speak about but one that enables somebody to come to the center point of the highway and never necessarily know why that drama is there, but knowing that there is drama below. And we're very interested in architecture's sectional capacity. So here you can actually start to see how on one hand, the park slides over the highway, but conversely, you could sort of say the highway slides under the park and the two enter into a, a kind of a conversation. And that conversation plays out as the Z starts to zig um, and crosses both highway and then train tracks. So here you can start to see that it's a very different experience. Whereas over the highway, the park is broad, horizontal. Here it's carefully defined by an art piece by Teresita Fernandez. As you cross over the train tracks, you can start to engage the trains as if they were uh, kinetic sculpture, which of course they are. Um, and then you descend to a waterfront, which, um, previously, uh, before uh, the park was complete, was uh, a rather inhospitable uh, parking lot. Uh, you really couldn't touch the water. And yet, it was an opportunity to kind of reclaim the importance of water to Seattle. It goes back uh, over a thousand years. And this kind of connection is both mystical and real. So we were able to construct a beach, uh, very carefully working with a series of hydrologists, so that we could, in a way, reintroduce the salmon habitat that had disappeared over the last hundred years. So we love the idea that even this beach is a kind of a piece of architecture. It's an aquatic piece of architecture. So here you can see how the project in a way is defined by a very simple idea, which is a park that wanders from the city to the water's edge. On the Brooklyn Botanic Garden on the other coast, uh, on the East Coast in New York City, it was an opportunity to also test architecture's reciprocal relationship to landscape. Um, so here was an invitation to create, um, in a way, um, a gateway or an entry to this marvelous uh, and very, very beautiful landscape that sits apart from the city. So the sense of, of uh, development of an architectural idea you can see expressed in the sort of origami models where you transition from the city to the garden in a rather effortless way. The building in some ways is defined as or is Defining a pathway system takes its form from a series of topographic conditions and pathway conditions that we inherited from the very beautiful layout by uh, the Olmsted brothers. So the building asserts itself as a piece of architecture in the city. It kind of claims its presence on the street and in Brooklyn as a kind of welcoming gateway. You can actually slide through the building without ever entering it. And we love the sort of sense that you can approach architecture through multiple paths multiple scenarios. Uh, you slide through the building at times. As you leave the park, it kind of bifurcates and always adjusts itself to, in this case, this very, very beautiful um, canopy, a, a very rare green cherry tree. So the building itself is defined by the landscape just as it shapes the landscape. You can enter the building and follow a kind of parallel route along a gallery and then enter into a very public room, a multi-use room, an event space for all sorts of activities, spontaneous and programmed. And what's interesting in this particular view is you can start to see the tapered shape of a leaf that defines this two-sided room that seats us, uh, you know, 160 people. And yet it expresses itself as this elevated piece of uh, a topography that enables light to pass through and also the ascent of the hillside to be legible. And that 10,000 square foot garden, if you will, is, a, is an experimental roof. And it's one that actually can host all kinds of landscapes uh, that, that change throughout the season. And yet this particular view shows a kind of equal parts, 100% architecture, 100% landscape existing in section. And that section is one that is barely visible uh, from the upper Ginkgo LA. And it's one that actually really changes very much in section. So from the bottom uh, section where you see 100% of the building, 
uh, and a little bit of the landscape to the top section where it's 100% landscape and a barely there uh, building. We were very excited to actually continue the project into a second phase to create a transformation of what had been an eroding hillside, but the key access point from the subway. Now, to actually uh, descend down that slope could have been done very efficiently with what was a nearby uh, subway uh, sloping uh, ADA ramp. And yet, because this is a garden, it was an interesting dialogue to think about the Robert Wilson Overlook, as it became named, as one that could be a wandering journey that was very, very slow all the way down the slope and simultaneously restore its erosion, but to create a more joyous path. And in this case, one that extends that nature of the inhabitable topography of the visitor center and carries it across the gateway to the site. It's one where uh, the ascent, if you will, from the Cherry Esplanade is one that actually ena enables you to have a topographic switchback. And those precast walls, which are all custom, which travel over 600 feet, uh, in many ways, we're hoping will be overtaken by the landscape uh, as it descends. And here you can see its overall unfolding geometries. And those curves are not just, uh, if you will, descriptive, but they are enabling us to get that total length and have a slope that doesn't require us to put handrails. And to look at this, it really is about not, not only actually creating a new experience in the garden, yet it's also one of feeling at once both inevitable and surprising as a place where the discovery that you're seeing here with the girls uh, going down the, the slope, if you will, or others having a conversation at the bend, or finally people taking uh, a place of entry from the subway to enter the garden. It's really about bringing it all together into an ensemble that's 100% urban and natural. And so that brings us to uh, just very nearby the Tata Innovation Center at Cornell Tech, which is on Roosevelt Island, another place that's uncanny in its being surrounded by water and nature and yet highly constructed as a place that was a former uh, hospital. Cornell Tech uh, acquired the site to be able to create a campus associated with tech, the emerging technology uh, industries in the city. And yet for us, it was the river to river views that inspired the idea of this, what they called a co-location between the academy and industry startups. Those river to river views were also balanced by a section that recognized that rising sea levels are also impacting the new campus. And so you can see how the shape of the building ascends upwards to clear and exceed the FEMA lines. Yet to actually invite collaboration, which is what this building is all about, uh, on vertical levels, uh, multiple levels, is one where we actually created the most inefficient circulation space, the most relaxed to ascend up and become a topography that would begin at the outside and define the kind of opening gesture and lifting gesture of the building and bring you into a place where you could imagine that that relationship between indoor and outdoor and the ascending vistas that one could have across to the UN, Manhattan, or across uh, to Queens are experienced at this liminal space in this view. So if you take uh, the, uh, our interest in the topography of a building and kind of start to walk through, you can start to see that you come into a kind of an interior space that has a very, very strong relationship to its exterior counterpart. And there is a kind of topography that we're interested in. So you can ascend up to a kind of piano nobile level where there's sort of primary studios are located. Um, and you can start to see that they too have a kind of sectional relationship, particularly as the building cantilevers out over the water or over the open space. And then you can uh, start to inhabit certain parts of the building in a way this is a kind of a, the prow of our ship, so to speak, where you can kind of get this incredibly panoramic view. And you can further ascend um, and start to kind of find places, uh, little eddies to kind of take in uh, a little moment of solitude or the more communal spaces of the roof become extremely attractive, not only as places for education, but also places where the community itself, the kind of tech community can start to gather informally. And then finally, it's a building that is very much aligned or owes its presence to this incredible infrastructural um, uh, sculpture, the sort of Queensboro Bridge, um, and um, in a way takes that kind of language and uh, moves it forward into this next century. This next project, very different in some ways, is uh, an opportunity for us, uh, daunting as it may be, to design a school of architecture for Kent State. And um, as you know, 
It's part of Ohio, a lot of abandoned factories. And there is something quite beautiful about the simplicity of these kind of large loft spaces and their ability to kind of bring in natural light that we found extremely interesting and very inspirational. So the building, in a way, takes this sort of simple loft uh, shape, this kind of rectangle, starts to tilt it up, allows for a series of trays to kind of break down the scale of the different studios, but also creates a series of public spaces at the lower level. So you can start to see that section actually gets mapped onto the facade in a way it kind of creates the facade itself so that the sort of sectional relationship of the interior becomes evident uh, as you proceed. And similarly on the oblique, parts of the building kind of kick out to become bay windows. Again, an attempt to kind of give the building a sculptural presence as you move either frontally or obliquely. And the kind of ascending topography that you can see in the building begins at the ground floor here. You can see a little cafe and the teaching spaces beyond. But as we make our way into the studio above, we actually discovered that there is, an, in fact, an incredible vista that connects to the different years, the different disciplines. And you can see the actual studio review spaces enclosed in glass so that they're acoustically independent, but still visible to the work spaces of the studio. And in fact, if we look down, this is at the very beginning of the school year. And of course, you can imagine that didn't last long. <laughs> and the idea of really being able to effectively see the kind of makings within the studio and beyond in the upper part of the screen and see what's going on in the review is sort of one idea of activity. And then the other is a place of real intellectual uh, exploration that can continue into the library with the materials library captured in that white cube within the library space <laughs> itself. Um, and yet the idea of scaling, reaching high to sort of join the scale of city or descending to the smaller scale of the residential area makes this building a bit of a chameleon. In, in so many ways too, the brick buildings that we loved at Kent and in the town were that place to join it. And this old uh, beehive factory that could in many ways make the differential colors of the brick come to life because of the distance from the heat was something that we added one more element of differentiation, which is the spin that mm -hmm. could catch the light. And that then could become the tactile place of engagement for anybody of any age uh, who might actually find their way uh, into the kind of ensemble of light and tactility that the building offers. Um, and certainly at night, one of the things that we love the most is from downtown. Uh, Kent, this is the view one has, which is the architects who we know and all the designers who are working 24 hours uh, and making the university stay alive. And so that brings us to the Singh Center for Nanotechnology uh, at University mm -hmm. of Pennsylvania. And it's a very interesting project in many ways because at the Northeast corner of the campus, none of the greens that we identify with defining the uh, sort of squares of downtown Philadelphia on your right or the campus greens themselves on the left, that that idea that the engineering district on the campus really was searching for a campus identity as much as it was searching, searching for the highest tech uh, laboratory on campus. So we wondered if we could actually take uh, the vibration electromagnetic interference obligations that located the core of the building at what they called the sweet spot um, and unfold from there things that could become more generous that could engage the campus and actually create through unhinging the kind of criteria of these labs uh, a destination that could become, in fact, a new campus screen for the engineering uh, community. As you look here, you can see this descending down of those volumes, the unboxing the boxes to create a landscape is something that um, uh, creates the defining element here of the cantilevered form, which Michael will talk further about. But most importantly, when you look at this, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing and that the cantilever in many ways is the easy part. It's a hung and bounded space that you can see here that defines this interior topography uh, of arriving into the building and being getting a view of the clean room in amber and the other spaces beyond. Often lab buildings are extremely anti-urban and um, anti-public. And this was a chance to kind of reverse that paradigm. Um, and um, in a way through the sort of lens of the lobby uh, to create a more liminal space between the public courtyard, the public quad, and uh, the hard sciences. So you can start to see that that lobby also has a three-dimensional aspect to it. And so far as the courtyard starts to get defined also by the interior wall of 
the labs, which uses this very beautiful amber glass, which is scientifically precise um, and important to um, not um, uh, compromising some of the incredible photometrics of the research that are occurring inside. So we, we actually took this glass and used it as a sort of a, a way in which you could mark the public uh, interface and the private interface of the lab. So the building's three-dimensional, you ascend. It does have a kind of topography. Um, stairs become places to stop and linger. Um, they become, in a way, multiple floors between the very high levels of uh, a typical lab building. So you can start to see that kind of sectional origami as you move up onto level two. Then you can further ascend through the stairs that you see on the left-hand side of the slide um, as you move up to the most public part, the kind of privileged public areas, uh, which Marion described up as the forum. And here, there are all sorts of conferences and events that take place in this kind of a, uh, Alto-esque, uh, a nod to Alto's um, a beautiful work with wood. And this wood, of course, does many, many things, including providing a high level of acoustic um, resiliency. So you can start to see how the building, in a way, uh, is a courtyard that unfolds three-dimensionally. It both brings light to a lower level, but also captures water. And the kind of idea of using the courtyard as a water detention area is something that uh, you'll see play out in other projects. Um, but it's uh, a building that is very much a city. And we love the idea that a lab could be part of the kind of flotsam and jetsam of urban life. Often they're so disentangled from urban life. Um, but here you can start to see how that kind of reciprocity between inside and outside plays out. And so that brings us to a very different project, which is also committed to innovation, which is the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale University. And in this case, also in the engineering precinct uh, of Yale, uh, was a, a pretty mineral surface here of a, of a courtyard that was really the backside of Breuer's Becton building, uh, uh, Collegiate Gossett building, Sterling, and then Watson building there on the left. So all of these were using this rooftop of a lab as the back but not a center. And we wondered if it'd be possible to create this destination to gather and convene people across all the disciplines uh, to come together and simultaneously not only have a destination, but transform and create a new courtyard for Yale. So that's exactly what you can start to see here is that transformation of that highly mineral surface into one that could be a connected courtyard, very much like the courtyards that you see on the lower left there, which are common to Yale. If we look at it though, as one that through its topographic variation was also framed by a very formidable concrete wall. I'm standing in front of it right there. And you can start to see how from a lower level to an upper level, there was no invitation. And so the first thing that we wanted to do was to actually break that wall down and create a promontory where unlike the other opaque buildings uh, surrounding, this wandering glass uh, structure could invite a new view on what innovation and engineering could look like. And here you can see, obviously, opening in the pandemic is an unusual moment. So you can see a few people here convening. Um, and yet, also, if the sun is strong, there's an automatic uh, solar guide for these curtains to be able to close. <laughs> but remaining in that curtain is a clear story to see out. And if we ascend to the upper level, there is enclosed conference rooms that provide acoustical independence and privacy, but also keep you connected to the larger collaborative studio below. What we're excited about is it's a building that in, in all its contemporaneous is actually capturing the collegiate Gothic in the distance and also transforming the way we might read or see brutalist architecture. And ultimately it's one that is uh, viewed as the kind of uh, the, the Edison bulb, if you will, on the campus to say ideas can spark here <laughs> and hopefully that invitation continues. So, the idea, though, of sparking interest in a place is one of transformation as well here at Artist Naples, the Baker Museum. And in Naples, Florida, there is a, a place that is very much vulnerable to uh, climate change. And here you could see Hurricane Irma, famous for not only the flooding, but the 185 mile an hour winds. And that, in fact, impacted this particular structure, which was a museum, uh, with a, you see the bubble there on the right attached to a box. And that had become vulnerable from the storm and needed to be renovated. And the 
the organization decided this was also an opportunity to expand the museum identity to be one that could involve performance and education and convening. So that expansion takes a look at something here on the south entry, which many people arrive from because it's where people park and it's really a service entry. Um, and what you can start to see here is that we, by extending that and actually wandering around the edge and clamping to that box, we could begin to simulate something that had felt inevitably relaxed and open and welcoming here with the classrooms below and event space above. It has a stone facade and that stone, if you will, is a counterpoint here to the formidable stone that actually marked the entry of the Baker Museum before. And by taking that formidable stone away, we could reveal the Paley Gates the artist who did these beautiful gates here. And also by the removal of that bubble that you had seen, that glass bubble, we could create a brand new courtyard to invite the community in. And I think uh, in, in some ways, this is a great lesson for us as architects that sometimes you can create architecture by removal by erasure, uh, rather than just adding more and more. And here, partially because some of these structures were damaged, it was also an opportunity to create a much more porous uh, invitation uh, beyond the kind of limits of what a typical museum would be. And that, that sort of sense of um, creating, uh, first and foremost, a courtyard that would identify the kind of part of both the new building, the new renovated museum, but also its adjacent counterpart, a concert hall, was uh, in a way the driver. And interesting enough, this became incredibly important during COVID. It was an opportunity to introduce a whole series of programs that otherwise uh, would have been shut down. So the creation of a courtyard in some ways, I think was a lesson for us that the reciprocity between spaces, in this case for performance or art, are just as valuable inside as they are outside. So there's a museum um, and a series of galleries. There are educational spaces for young musicians, uh, for different classes, arts classes. But it's also an idea of ascent, uh, movement through an existing building, through a new renovated building. And that idea of movement is something that, um, you know, we're starting to kind of, I, I suppose in this talk, uh, frame up as a sort of a, a driver, uh, it, is paradigmatically important for us in shaping of architecture. So that kind of curvilinear facade uh, allows you to move from the gallery out to the edges uh, into an event space, which is used for small concerts. Um, and then it sort of uh, travels back out again. So you're always moving in the building and out the building and kind of understanding this sort of uh, dialogue between inside and outside. And then finally, it's also, a courtyard that could be used uh, both early in the morning, um, in the middle of the day for performances, or late in the evening as just a quiet place to, um, to be and to contemplate. Very different kind of situation, very different kind of program was the visitor reception for uh, Novartis, which is a large pharmaceutical company. And this we did a number of projects for them. This was part of their North American headquarters uh, in New Jersey about um, 30, 40 miles outside of New York City. So this was um, the little guardhouse or rather forbidding uh, piece of, uh, of uh, nondescript architecture. Um, and it was imperative that they develop uh, a much more sophisticated way of greeting visitors, transitioning from the car uh, as you're dropped off to a jitney service uh, so that the campus in a way was automobile free. And here, this interest in the hybridity of is this a building or is it a piece of landscape uh, gave us a chance to play out uh, a series of themes that um, have been important to our work. So um, the building in a way takes a sense of a fence and opens it up, kind of a gateway, it slips. And the gateway is sort of defined by a series of topographic moods, a series of ascending berms that in a way create a, a kind of a threshold, a liminal space between the outside world and the inside world. So um, as you leave your car, you walk along the edge of this subtly curving wall into uh, the pavilion under this kind of giant canopy that captures water. This is a net zero building. So the capture of water and sunlight was crucial you slide into a very neutral space, completely in contrast to the rush, to the lush Sylvan landscape. And then um, you move through a series of columns that define that kind of threshold. And then you emerge onto the campus side. 
And uh, you can start to see the kind of play of the canopy of the roof and these uh, ascending or descending berms that help define the building or give it alternatively uh, a place in the landscape. And this idea of actually the threshold of security and public invitation is something that Michael just described in the Novartis Visitor Center, where we needed to have security, and yet we also needed to create invitation. And there is nothing more important in an embassy project, and this is the U.S. Embassy New Delhi India project that we're working on, nothing important than an embassy to be able to create that sense of welcome and legibility, and yet also uh, make sure that uh, the kind of ideas of being safe and secure are also importantly recognized. Now, the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi, India, in 1959, Edward Durrell Stone created this incredible marriage of inspirations that came from the Taj Mahal and the stature of a symmetrical structure against the water um, to something that could also su suggest sustainable breathing architecture. And as we started to study the opportunities in the rejuvenation of the 27-acre campus, we started to look at the beautiful marriage where walls are very much a creation of place in Port Agra or a creation of gardens, which you can see in the Lodi Gardens. Here. And all of these came together in our mind to recast the consideration of boundary and also create the idea of not one building after another on the campus, but perhaps one building because of another. As we start to look at uh, this effectively new embassy building here that we're creating, uh, the threshold of water inspired us as a place of passage and invitation, and walls could also suggest that invitation. And you can see our early sketches here uh, being in dialogue with the beautiful canopy of the Edward Jarrell Stone Building and framing a new landscape. So the idea of a central path forming a sequence of uh, places of engagement uh, to the buildings on the campus, and also a tape vert, if you will, a green runway, it becomes a central campus green, again, as a place of engagement, creates then a legible journey where both new and existing buildings on, the, on this campus can be seen together. And it's really a place where we're assembling these walls to do the work of bounding, but also unbounding an invitation. In this case, you can see in the building that notion of invitation coming together around the idea of landscape to create that framed uh, place of arriving through a grove and seeing side by side and not in conflict, the existing embassy building and the new building. Those are also seen, if one were to come to the main building, you could also see that historic uh, fountain as still legible as it was, but doing something very, very new. And in this case, uh, we know there's monsoons and drought. And so the water is being collected into stormwater tanks below during the monsoon and keeping an enduring uh, body of water available during drought. About 30% of this building is below grade so that we can take advantage of a kind of a thermal um, uh, neutralizing factor. Um, but it's also an important uh, way in which we can keep our new building at the same elevation or slightly lower than the historic Edward Durrell Stone building. Um, and the third uh, attribute that we've been particularly interested in is this sort of sense of uh, altering or, or highly modifying the sectional ideas around the ground plane. So uh, you can start to see how the walls that Marion talked about wind their way in and start to define the more public spaces. And, um, and this is, uh, for example, a kind of a cutaway section through the lobby but it also shows how we can start to develop aspects where you reach the sky, the section moves up, or you move down to create a series of courtyards. And these walls define a, a whole set of precincts from the most public and the most honorific to the most public. There's a, there is a language of walls in Indian architecture that we hope to capture. So here you see the kind of walls winding in to create uh, the kind of primary lobby entrance to the embassy. Um, and those walls were marked in a way or given uh, a kind of counterpoint through the jolly screens of the primary facades of the rest of the building itself. And they, they build on this sort of tradition that was established thousands of years ago, but also uh, developed through uh, Edward Durrell Stone interest in the jolly screen or this sort of beautiful intricate screen, which uh, modifies light and mediates the harsh sunlight. So you can start to see 
our studies of how we could introduce a woven set of free cast panels to normalize light conditions. And you can start to see how that plays out in terms of animating the facade, particularly as you move on the oblique through this kind of linear landscape, this sort of top d'hiver that Miriam described as a kind of primary governing element of uh, the, uh, the campus planning. Um, the very large canopy roof also shields you, protects you, and allows through evaporative cooling uh, to kind of bring the temperature down to something that's a, a little bit more uh, pleasant and controllable. And this kind of thin blade, again, is an acknowledgement of the kind of development of the roof of the Edward Durrell Stone Building, um, while it asserts, uh, we hope, its own DNA. And so this next project here, we're looking at reimagining La Brea tar pits. And if any of you have been down to Los Angeles, one of the things that's so exciting about it is it's definitely a place of uh, the past uh, in, in incredible ways, Plasticine era, but also a place that's in a hurry to get to its future. So um, this is the second to the last project, but it's actually our most recent project. So you get this uh, sense of tar literally bubbling up, um, but it's also uh, an incredible period of the Pleistocene because it was the last period of intense climate change. So the research that's being done here is extremely relevant. Um, and we love the kind of uh, the ironic um, juxtaposition of the past revealing itself in a city that very much has based its existence around the future. Um, in the heart of LA, off of Wilshire Boulevard, active research is happening as we speak now. It's a kind of 24 seven research into the kind of mysteries of the Pleistocene era. And those are gathered here. And in many ways, the museum needs uh, a radical expansion to house all the fossils, including microfossils that are being unearthed. Um, and yet it's a existing museum is a very introverted building. It's kind of hidden and um, very quiet, uh, inward looking. And there are large areas of excessive paving um, particularly inhospitable given uh, LA's extreme climate. Very, very hot and that, that kind of climate change is likely to increase. So we said, you know, why not think of the museum itself as part of the site? Why not think of part of the site as activating the museum? So we wanna kind of take the box and break it open. And um, also uh, to do so in the context of a very, very interesting uh, area of Los Angeles, not right next to LACMA, where um, there's a new expansion. There's also a Renzo Piano expansion uh, uh, adjacent to that. And um, you can start to see uh, in the kind of bright green uh, our territory, uh, the territory of both the Page Museum and Hancock Park, which is a public park. So how to make sense out of a series of discrete elements that had no relationship to each other, that didn't amount to uh, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. Um, what we identified uh, were three kind of zones, uh, what we were calling latent opportunities that you see marked here in terms of research and revelation, uh, the active uh, research pits, community and culture, which is the museum itself in a large open space, and then the sense of spectacle and fiction being in Los Angeles. Um, and out of that came the sense of a kind of a, a triple loop that would connect all of these disparate parts without necessarily rearranging them, but really accepting their placement and finding a kind of an architectural figure that would stitch them together. So the lenses then become a way in which we can take the museum and move it outside of the limits of its box to uh, become uh, literally integrated into the research that's occurring on the site. And similarly, the landscape becomes an opportunity to kind of reverse some of the degradation that's occurred through this sort of intense climate warming, introducing more shade, 400 new trees, new grass slopes that will help tamper the climate. And so here you can start to see how that, that kind of concept gets played out in a more elaborate uh, site plan. And it's that site plan that we were excited about and we called the scheme in the competition Loops and Lenses as a way of getting a deeper lens uh, through that kind of tra traveling through time and traveling across the site into the Holocene, which is 12,000 years ago with the coastal woodlands, the present Anthropocene, which is where the museum is and where the central green is, and the Pleistocene itself uh, 
2.5 million years ago where that bioswale could identify the cool microclimate that used to be part of Los Angeles. And together this wandering uh, experience is, you know, as you can start to see, it's starting to make sense of the relationships between LACMA, the Page Museum, the research, the excavation, and even the lake pit uh, where you saw those incredible uh, mammoths and mastodons. Although one of the things that's very important about Wilshire Boulevard and uh, Los Angeles itself is that there's a great deal of shade uh, equity uh, that's been challenged. And in fact, in the poorest areas of the city, one would never find a tree, let alone a canopy. So we started to look at that idea of welcoming gateway as something through the shelter of trees or an artificial canopy. The experience of the park could come together and the, the opening of the lens, the carving through that opaque green that had once been the berm that concealed the museum uh, from the community could now become a place where we could see all of those coming together. So the canopy to the right shelters the, those who are doing the work of the excavation that you can see here below, but enabling the people who are working 362 days a year to become part of a dialogue with the community that can at any given time see what the status is of that excavation into the tar. So on the lower right, on the lower right, you can see that was the existing Page Museum and our expansion was trying to enable this collection and uh, the research to continue to have room to breathe while also framing community green. Mm -hmm. So you can start to see on the left, uh, the Pleistocene garden that exists there. And then to the right, we're creating now a new pit that actually draws exhibition deep into the earth and starts to connect that collection that Michael had shared earlier, fully hidden from view into the research area and bringing it out for that public engagement ex and experience. And in fact, Page Museum was the very first to pioneer the idea of a working laboratory as part of the public experience. Many museums have copied that since then. So the idea is giving that even more room to breathe and still enable uh, people who are visiting to understand that relationship between research and the profound revelation of that which has been found in perfect preservation uh, in the tar, the mammoths, the mastodons, and the dire wolves. So ultimately though, it is creating a simultaneity of engagement here with the community, that lens that's carving through the earth, uh, that's enabling people to sit out as if it was a drive-in movie to see the changing narratives unpacked at night, very much like LA, a storytelling place. And ultimately one that that storytelling comes to life to invite the community in. So the final project of the evening um, is Hunters Point South Waterfront Park. In this case, you can start to see simultaneously a place uh, between Newtown Creek and the East River, a place that has a prominence in our imagination because of its aspect of views that look out into the distance. And yet it is one that's had an interesting history. It's more or less a, an invented site that's evolved over time from being a wetlands to uh, a gridded precinct for an active court and ultimately a place that was abandoned. And so uh, as the mayor was interested in bringing this into focus, it was also clear that it was a very vulnerable uh, piece of land and Hurricane Sandy certainly brought many pieces of land at the water's edge underwater. So how does one begin to think about taking a site that was left over uh, vulnerable to flooding and created as a destination for a growing community that has yet to be defined. So we thought really about uh, the kind of passive and active sources of recreation and what it might be like to invite the water in when that was necessary and let it release out so that it could be a dynamic temporal landscape. So here you can see it really as a kind of a working infrastructure with a central green and an unfurling arc that leverages a topography that gets up nearly to 30 feet, highest point in fact, in all of Long Island. Now, if you look at that though, how do we begin to think of structures? In some cases, Parks Department wanted four separate structures and we thought it'd be very interesting to enable all of them to gather themselves to open and unfurl, to open to the urban view and frame a city green. And in this case, it's one that's both an active playing field and a crescent of elevated grass that becomes a place for spectators to enjoy. And yet it's also kind of a hard working structure, this canopy that's uh, right near the, um, uh, the, the ferry that comes in and out is one that also collects uh, solar energy and also collects water. Uh, so the solar energy powers all the lighting in the park and the water in fact sources the irrigation. 
You can also see though we've elevated this particular structure above our FEMA guidelines. So if you look at it here, there's that central green. Uh, you can see it reaching out. Uh, you can start to see that there it is with the, the newly recreated beach. There was a water taxi beach there before. Um, and one that really is an ensemble, the dog run, the rail park, uh, the playground, the green, and one that could further transform in a second phase, uh, which Michael will talk about, that topography that was so dramatic and, list, and for us became a place where we could envision perhaps being on the deck of an aircraft carrier looking out to the city. And we wondered, in fact, if we could leverage that topography and create a two-story park at a particular location through structuring an entirely new infrastructure that could open to the views. So actually this was uh, constructed in a boat uh, building a marine facility uh, up in Maine and then uh, shipped down. And you can start to see how the act of thinking about construction also allowed us to think about a kind of a language. Um, so it's uh, lifted, hoisted, uh, spun uh, around, and positioned onto this uh, rather significant concrete uh, embankment. And then um, you can start to see how it takes its shape as a counterpoint, uh, as a sort of public belvedere, which is a counterpoint to the reintroduced wetlands. And we should say that this project started 10 years ago when the idea of soft infrastructure, infrastructure that was resilient, was really a radical idea. And it wasn't radical because we were the first to propose it. Um, I think we were following on some of the research that others uh, had done, but this was the first park in New York City that allowed water to flood in. And in so doing, what we thought was kind of important is to treat that as a, a positive aspect, uh, an aesthetic aspect, rather than a uh, much more typical brute force. So here you can see uh, water at low tide, uh, the East River is tidal. And you can start to see how the marsh grasses uh, love the kind of sense, the impermanence of different water levels. So the idea of introducing multiple landscapes, multiple itineraries was something that uh, working closely with uh, Arab engineers and uh, TBA um, helped us, uh, I think, uh, reach a, uh, a different kind of paradigm for designing a waterfront park. Um, at times you literally move out through the sort of fortified edge that protects the wetlands against uh, flooding, but also introduces the sort of much more haptic pleasures of essentially walking on water. You're almost out at high tide along the edge of the water. There are little places as you swoop around uh, that you can find uh, a level of intimacy that uh, otherwise you might not be able to enjoy. Um, places for selfies, which uh, are increasingly part of urban life and have given, in a way, uh, a sense of publicness, uh, rationale for publicness as we create spaces. Um, we're also interested in the temporal, and here you see the creation of a little island. Um, at times it's a peninsula, and then at high tide, um, through these sort of marsh grasses, um, it becomes flooded and becomes an island approachable by this uh, curvilinear bridge. Um, and the island is graced by um, uh, a Japanese artist, uh, Nobu, um, who uh, created uh, a very, very beautiful set of seven moons, these kind of uh, circular dishes that uh, allow you to kind of take in um, the evening uh, uh, drama of, uh, of light at night in the evening. But it's also an infrastructural project, as we mentioned, this sort of idea of the bifurcation of architecture, infrastructure, and landscape has uh, been something that uh, we and others have felt uh, has been uh, tragically wrong. So it was a chance to kind of bring infrastructure into focus, um, uh, a chance to use the kind of infrastructural bridge building capacity to create new kinds of spaces. And the sense that you'll see in the movie film, the sense of creating a kind of a, a choreography of different uses that range from highly public to much more private, from the communal to one of solitude.
So we'll conclude with uh, on an optimistic note, which is uh, our conviction that architecture, indeed design, has the capacity to address some of these kind of most current, most pressing issues around climate change, um, and to do so in a transformative and inventive way. Thank you. Oh, right now I'm unmuted. Sorry, there, there's people in the chat room who have some questions. And anybody in the audience have questions they want to ask? Anybody? We have the chat room here. Nice question. Okay. Uh, here's one from Craig Farnsworth. <clears throat> um, I'll just try to read that out. I think maybe that may be the best way. It says, your freehand drawings are especially informative and evocative. Can you please speak to the role of drawing in your design process and how it informs your work? Uh, Michael and I will both uh, answer this because both of us draw um, uh, on all of our projects as both a way of thinking, of making, of, of limbering ideas without the kind of constraints of definition. And so for us, uh, whether it's charcoal or, or pencil, we're kind of freehanding enables a, a clarity of thinking that doesn't yet have all the full obligations of explicit boundaries or programmatic obligations. And that becomes a kind of back and forth throughout the whole process for us. Yeah, and I, I would say, um, you know, we have all sorts of um, sophisticated programs, uh, uh, digital programs. We also uh, love uh, analog models, but I, I think, for us, drawing has a kind of primal quality. And as Marion said, it's a communicative. Uh, it's communicative capacity is, I think, what's really interesting. So in a way, it's a shorthand for us uh, to kind of talk to each other or to talk to other members in our studio. Uh, you know, the power of a drawing is uh, it can quite literally say many, many things to many people. So that sort of sense of a kind of shorthand, a visual shorthand, is really crucial to how we practice. Okay, um, we have another person in the chat. Uh, it says there seems to be a pattern throughout all projects of piecing together different elements such as landscape and culture. Are there any driving factors that you know you want to maintain throughout each project at the beginning of the design process? Um, great question. Um, we wish there was a sort of tele teleological way in which we could kind of approach each project. I think a, a formula would certainly help us quite a bit. I, I think we do, there is a pattern and, and, and thank you for, for um, highlighting that. Um, I think we want to immerse ourselves first and foremost around a whole set of multiple histories that are part of a site. It's cultural history, it's geologic history, it's economic history, uh, social history. Um, and in a way, um, just kind of literally fill, fill our conference rooms with all sorts of images and data. And then I think we try to settle down and find a kind of a, a way in which a diagram or an idea or a metaphor could start to absorb all these different histories in a way that allows each history to kind of be somewhat apparent um, without um, losing the kind of identity of that which we were proposing, a kind of inherent DNA of an evolving design. So in Seattle, the kind of figure of the Z, a very simple diagram, allowed us to think about the ecological histories of the site as well as um, the idea of culture, uh, sculpture in a landscape. Just to add to that, it, you know, there truly is no formula, yet clearly I think Michael and I have shared a preoccupation with the value that's intrinsic of a given site and a value that's intrinsic to the kind of culture that may or may not be in evidence, uh, both on a site and also through a program that might be introduced by an institution that has yet to mm. reveal the gifts of what that uh, what that narrative might mean in conjunction with that site. Part of our delight, I think, is teasing 
out deeper histories and connections to see if there may be something that is both surprising and yet one might never imagine what that site had been like without those, um, those new additions. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, anybody else with any other questions in the chat or anything you want to type them in or in the audience here? Anybody? Anything? Um, okay, well, with that, I want to thank uh, Marion Weiss and Mike Medford again for sharing um, their lessons, their stories, and these images with us. They're talking about their design philosophy. It's uh, very insightful. Um, Please join me in thanking them for Okay, um, David, do you want to say anything or? No, we got a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, thanks again, everybody. And everybody in the chat for joining in. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much for inviting us.